Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, World Satellite Business Week C-Level interview. My name is uh, Steve uh, Beauchanger. I'm the uh, Chief Operating Officer of your consult, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with Tori Bruno, President and CEO of ULA. Hi, Tori. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing just fine. Uh, Tori, uh, ULA has been a long-time partner of your consultant of the World Satellite Business Week, and we thank you very much for that, obviously. Uh, we're now only a, a few days away from the show, and I'm delighting to spend some time with you on, uh, um, on this uh, interview and get some, uh, uh, some time to get uh, your views on uh, ULA business perspectives. Um, I'd like maybe to start first with a question of one of the uh, hot topics uh, of the last few days, uh, you know, as NASA is preparing for the launch of the first Artemis mission. No tentatively rescheduled uh, for next Saturday, so cross fingers. Um, this is obviously a major milestone right, for the uh, uh, Moon to Mars program and for all industry participants, and ULA is one of them uh, with the uh, cryogenic uh, propulsion stage. What perspectives does the Artemis mission and more generally the Return to Moon program uh, bring for ULA? Well, it's just really exciting for us and to be able to be a participant in it with our interim cryogenic propulsion stage really drives it home. It is taking us back to the moon with human exploration, reopening that book, but this time in a much more meaningful way where, you, where we intend to have a permanent exploration presence. There are big rockets coming that are still in development. They are really optimized for commercial industrial use. This rocket is a moon rocket designed specifically for that. And when we have that extended presence on the moon, not only will we learn so much more about it, but it will lead the way to opening up that cislunar economy I've talked about before because of the tremendous natural resources on the moon, and of course, most importantly, the massive quantities of ice, water, which can be converted into propellant to enable that whole economic activity. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see uh, the uh, next Saturday if the uh, if the uh, the mission can may uh, can make it. And uh, obviously, as, as I said, uh, we cross uh, we cross fingers. Let's go now to more uh, market related issues, right? Um, I'm interested to get your views uh, on your business environment. Um, all suppliers, including yourself, are working on transitioning to uh, the new generation of launchers. On the customer side as, as well, we see some shifting needs uh, from commercial and government customers. So how would you characterize your launch market context today? And how is it maybe different from what you've seen in, you know, like, five years or 10 years ago even. Well, let me start with the difference because there has been just a profound change or a true sea state change in the lift market. For many, many years, there has really always been a condition of oversupply because multiple countries consider access to space a sovereign imperative. So lots of launch vehicles in comparison to the number of missions. And that has virtually changed overnight, literally within the last year, to a position of scarcity. The geo market for telecommunications has not changed. It continues healthy but flat. What has happened is the proliferated LEO, the internet going to space with these vast mega constellations. And in fact, for us here at ULA, we won the largest commercial space contract in history just earlier this year, 47 launches initially to get the Kuiper constellation up and on orbit, a system which will have more performance than anything conceived to date. It'll bring internet to vast parts of the planet that don't have it now. We're really excited to be a part of that, but it really changes the whole character of the marketplace with just tremendous commercial opportunity, which by the way, is focused on LEO. How would you characterize the competition evolving uh, compared to in the past, you used to compete with a few, you know, uh, historical incumbents. You now you see as well more uh, 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 competitors and newcomers, potential like, as well potential partners. How do you uh, see yourself evolving with this new uh, competitive environment? Absolutely. So, the, you know, the great thing about the vehicle that we're going to be flying here in just a few months is its flexibility. It is, in fact, optimized for high energy, the most difficult and complex orbits that are really 
the purview of military missions for the government, but we've designed it with the flexibility, the ability to add or subtract solids, the, uh, the presence of two different upper stages that we have optionally to fly to be able to reach down into this Leo market. It's why we won that big contract. And, and so what we are seeing overall in the industry is what I've been predicting for a number of years as we've been to the conference that Leos are coming, the proliferated Leos, the mega constellations are coming, they're here now and they demand the smallest possible dollar per spacecraft on orbit. That's the economic driver, which pushes them onto heavy launch vehicles. So the, we, we are seeing the small or the micro launch vehicle market collapse. As I've said, there's room for about two, special missions, demonstrations, urgent needs that are relatively limited in scope. Those will always be there, that market will exist, but it will not sustain the 10 or 12 that are trying to occur now. So you are expecting major consolidation process uh, within the coming uh, coming in. We are absolutely expecting that. And the other trend that is becoming very important in the marketplace in terms of its influence is in fact, the uh, reaction to the difficult experiences in the investment community with SPACs and with the oncoming pressures with inflation and potentially a recession. So cash is now becoming expensive and it's also becoming hard to get at any price. That's gonna drive a lot more discipline and focus into the investment community. When we pair that with the new space SPAC environment, which has destroyed about $14 billion of investment, when we take those companies together and we take their valuations that were present at the beginning of the year and we look to now, more than half of that money is gone. And so that, that's gonna cause folks, I think not, I hope to flee the space industry because we want that investment, but I think we'll see a lot more focus. They will be choosy about the companies that are invested in. And I hope that those companies will actually have more consistent and perhaps even more investment focused on them. Good. Let's move to uh, another question uh, and more this, on the specificity on, on, on Vulcan. Uh, so ULA obviously has been operated the Atlas rocket. It has been a real success story in terms of uh, reliability. It's been the workhorse of the uh, US Guard missions. Now with Vulcan coming in the market, what kind of capabilities do you bring to your uh, uh, government and your commercial customers? Yes, Vulcan's a great rocket. It is a single core heavy. It replaces our entire line. It replaces the Atlas and the Delta IV medium and the Delta IV heavy. We literally have more lift capability in that single core Vulcan, which looks like a big Atlas, than we have in that big three core Delta IV heavy. In addition to that, we have two and a half times more energy in the upper stage and about 50% more endurance so there are no Earth orbits or really even cislunar orbits that we cannot now take our payloads directly to. You know, when you, when you fly a commercial GTO or when you fly to LEO, even when you fly certain interplanetary missions, for the rocket, that's a LEO mission because the rocket is done. And to get above that takes unique capabilities. That's what we have in Vulcan and what we've extended. So a great LEO truck, but now we can do even more in those higher energy orbits. And uh, you consider Vulcan to be as well well addressed for uh, the pure commercial uh, 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 clients, whether GEO on, on LEO, you expect it to have a, uh, a strong uh, attraction uh, on the commercial side for your, for your, yeah. your new launcher? We do, you know, the, the large size of that core together with our LEO optimized upper stage allows us to be very competitive there. And, you know, as I said, the proof is in the pudding. You know, we won the largest lift contract in history, which is a Leo lift for commercial mega constellations for Amazon, for the Amazon Kuiper. Can you tell us on that specifically on the Kuiper uh, contract, which has been a major milestone in the commercial market history, uh, the, the, largest, uh, the largest commercial single launch contract, uh, what specificities uh, this contract brings by dealing such a large volume of mission with one single customer? Uh, what are the specificities of that? Yeah, so for us in particular, 
It is a total of 47 launches, first nine being Atlas. They bought out the available Atlases, the remaining 38 being on Vulcan. And then there will be more after that. What that means to us as a business and also to the US industrial base, for example, is that that takes a lot of infrastructure that I don't have today. So it enables me to make really large investments. You know, I will have two buildings, two integration facilities to assemble the rocket and integrate payloads where I only have one now at Cape Canaveral at my pad. I will triple the transportation capacity that we have. Now uh, there'll be, you know, our, our rocket ship plus three more vessels to carry and transport rockets. We will build a whole nother factory. Blue will build another factory to build engines, basically doubling the factory that they have in Huntsville today. Our entire supply chain is impacted by this. It's not just doubling my infrastructure. Northrop Grumman, who builds my solids, are building an entirely new set of facilities in their uh, factory in Utah to keep up with that demand, because each of these takes our full complement of six solids. So it's it's double the launch rate for me. I'll be flying every two weeks. But for a company like Northrop Grumman, it's, it's many times more solids. So it is essentially doubling the industrial base for lift in the United States. Do you expect this kind of large batch contracts to be replicated uh, with the Constellation models and so on? This is something that you are expecting, or is it like a kind of one-off very specific to this specific uh, commercial program? Yeah. No, we intend that this, or we expect that this sort of marketplace continues and that these uh, customers buy in large blocks like this, even larger, more likely in the future. And so that contributes to this environment I talked about a few moments ago, where we went from always having a surplus of launch capacity worldwide to suddenly having a scarcity because of this new market. And of course, with the additional exacerbation due to the you know, issues in Ukraine where the Russians are kind of off the marketplace you know, for Western commercial missions now. So block buys will be important. If you don't buy a block of missions, you're gonna have potentially trouble getting on the manifest when you want to be there. Mm, good point. Last question, uh, Vulcan is approaching its first launch. Um, can you update us on, on your planning and how the preparation for the first flight is coming along? Yes, oh my gosh, we're so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have the first stage booster built and done. We are waiting on our first stage engines, the mm -hmm. BE-4 from Blue Origin. They have built my first two flight engines and are in the process of getting them acceptance tested through their facility in Texas. That involves cold testing and a hot fire. When all of that is done, we'll get them down in Decatur, Alabama and put them on that booster. Meanwhile, we're building the upper stage. It's nearly finished. I will likely have that done just before the first stage is fully assembled. The payload fairing's already done. And uh, then we'll put all of that on the rocket ship, take it down to Cape Canaveral. We'll do a number of special tests because it's the first flight. And we'll even do what we call a flight readiness firing where we literally bolt this rocket to the ground <laughs> onto the pad and we'll fire up that engine and we'll exercise them and make sure everything's working fine. And then uh, you know we'll take it off the pad, we'll inspect it, and then we'll be ready to go. We will be flying to the moon on our very first mission. We have a real payload. It's not a test flight. So a company out here called Astrobotics will be flying NASA's first commercial lunar uh, logistics mission, their first CLPS mission uh, with their Peregrine spacecraft that will go to the surface of the moon. Also in a way historic because it's the first commercial lander to go to the moon. So as soon as they are ready, We'll have a rocket standing by for them and uh, away we'll go. Yeah, so we're any... almost there, months from uh, smoke and fire on the pad, pretty exciting. Do you have any period, uh, um, uh, tentative dates or uh, months or, yeah, uh, of life? Yes, end of the year is what oh, we're yeah. driving towards. Guess we're not being more specific than that because it's, you know, it's, there's still a lot of work to get done. And, and oh, as yeah. you know, in development, it's not over till it's over. Obviously. And so does my payload. This is their very first spacecraft. Yeah. 
they're doing very well, but they also have a lot of work in front of them. And I would, uh, I'd be very reluctant to go to space without them. <laughs> Lots of exciting milestones, uh, definitely in the launch business. Well, I think now it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, Tori, for sharing these insights uh, with us. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing the ULA team, uh, the World Satellite Business Week in Paris, and pushing the conversation uh, further. Uh, bye now. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye, Steve. Bye. Thank you.